Oh yeah, and our podcast can drink again. Shout out. We gotta throw a party for the podcast. We do. Dwayne, get over here. <laughs> Welcome back everyone to the Coconut Curry Podcast episode 21 here. If you're new around here, we are a podcast with three college students at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm Justin, that's Peter, and Raj is missing the podcast today. We went nearly 21 straight episodes without missing many yeah. guests, and Raj, unfortunately, is sick. So he is down he's horrendous. Going to I think he's literally upstairs right now. Just yeah. sleeping it off. Yeah. Um, but we're just going to ride with the two of us today. Um, unfortunately, he'll miss the Super Bowl predictions, and we don't get to get him on record. But we get to bully him on air. Maybe, so. and maybe we'll get him to post a little segment on him making his pick so he can get memed yes. for it. Um, we're on all platforms, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcast. Please like, comment, subscribe. It helps us out a lot. We're up to 70 subscribers on the road to 100. Ah. Um, and here we just chat about sports, hopefully offer a new perspective. We try to go away from the gimmicks and the hot takes and just kind of yeah. your backyard. Talk Do you want to talk sports. to some random white guys about sports? There That's us. Go. That's us. Just white guys of the podcast. Well, white guys of the podcast and our token minority. Yes. Right? And white guys this week, though. Every yes, week. white guys this week. <laughs> the core of the podcast <laughs> right here. <laughs> um. And as someone had commented on our post, just nice to hear two people without the gimmicks. I don't know if you listened to the whole episode, but appreciate Clearly the Clearly listen to the clip, so we appreciate it. Yep. As we always start our podcast with, we react to comments. You usually yes. hate comments because they're, they're funny. funny, and we like to talk about them because usually they have something to do with our analysis of the game, so yeah. we like to elaborate or provide mm. further instance. So Peter got a lot of hate on Taylor Swift on our clip, which, yeah. thanks for commenting. It was clickbait. That's why we posted it. Yeah. Um, but Peter, what hate were you getting from both sides of the aisle? Yeah, so uh, I don't think anybody actually watches any of the clips that we post sometimes because that one specifically, we got people that were saying, why are you whining about Taylor Swift? She wasn't even on screen that much. As I literally said in the video that she isn't on screen that much. We'll, we'll insert clip right here. The NFL loves villains because you need it. You need one of those. Bell's point of view. Oh, well, how else can we piss people off? <laughs> oh, so you're telling me that people don't love seeing Taylor Swift all the time? Okay. Well, then we're just going to get a camera on her whenever we can. But here's the thing. She's not even um, on yeah. screen yeah. that much. Whenever you see Taylor Swift, it's, oh, well, they put her on all the time because they put her on after a touchdown. And half the time, people are looking at their phones during the entire game. So that whenever they hear the announcer start screaming, they look up and see, oh, there's there's a touchdown. Oh, there's Taylor Swift because Travis Kelsey scored. And then <laughs> we got people on the other side saying that she was on screen every single time they showed her, like after a big play or something, even though that person clearly didn't watch the podcast because we literally did a breakdown from the New York Times article where they literally showed exactly how long she was on screen, which was what, like 24 seconds or something like Some, that? Something total? ridiculous. And this something isn't, like, this isn't yeah. like a conspiracy. This, this is, is like we ha like there has been somebody who's gone through and calculated the total time and it's not that much. They just they had their iPhone with a timer out and they just like, oh, she's on screen time. OK, she's off. Stop write it down like it's not even but they knew better they knew better clearly they knew more than somebody that literally just wrote down the exact time clearly it was every time not even when travis scored every time no it was every big play they always showed taylor swift because she's the offensive coordinator <laughs> surely that's what happened they knew better i swear yep. yeah that was just very interesting also some of those were very funny so yeah Always great Taylor Swift drama. Gotta um, love it. Shout out to her for winning Grammy and her oh, new yeah. album in April, which is going to break the world because now Again. it's in the football world yeah. as well. So that's cool. Um, I got some hate as well for talking oh, yeah. about Lamar. I got a quote that said, I didn't watch the game and I was just making it up to start, um, which is just a crazy quote. Um, too many hits in there yeah. to really comprehend. But I just want to say to people, if we say something on a clip that is mildly incorrect, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Sometimes I post it because it is incorrect and I want you to comment. Yeah. Particularly this comment was aimed at me saying that Lamar was out of the pocket when he was strip sacked in the AFC championship game. I went back. You're right. He wasn't out of the pocket. He did a 10 step drop, climbed up through the pocket and then went to go throw the ball. So he was still within the pocket but he had done a drop step 
run up through the pocket. And so like it wasn't a traditional like four or five step drop, just throw the ball. Oh, he got strip sacked. Like he was moving a lot in that pocket and it was empty for him to go run outside and he got strip sacked. So I'm sorry that he was <laughs> wasn't in he wasn't outside the pocket, but go watch the clip. It's very clear that it's not a play where it's a three, four step drop has no time right down on his arm. Yeah. Um, it, he had plenty of time to make a decision yeah. instead of just holding it. That's that's the issue with the clip is not him fumbling. It is him not making a decision. Yes. That's literally the point. Yep. And this is where I wanted to bring up the comment of the week, which was quote, strip sack is a defensive effort, not Lamar's fault. Try again. Number one to the person who commented this. You're a dumbass. Um, <laughs> Strip sack is a defensive effort. That is 100% correct. It is a defensive effort. Defend- also- defenders should 100% be rewarded and yeah. encouraged to get strip sacks because they get the ball back in. You have to have a good timing and good strength to punch the ball out for sure. Not Lamar's fault is absolutely crazy. Yeah. You turn the ball over. Like if you hold on to the ball, if you tuck it, if you have better awareness, you don't turn the ball over. And it's not like it's an incomplete pass when you get strip sacks. You give the ball to the other team. Yeah. So it's a double, it's like a double negative. You didn't make a play on the drive and you turn the ball over. So it, it has to be like, there's very few times I would say a strip sack is hundred percent, not the QB's fault. Um, maybe if it's like a two step drop, people come on block and you just get nailed. Yeah, it's it, like, well, well he couldn't do anything. He, there was literally nothing he could do, but then like the part of being a quarterback is having that pocket awareness. Or if it's late in the game or before the half and you're, trying to make a play get into field goal range or into the uh, end zone and you reach and you get strip sack strip sacked or you cause a fumble and like they get the ball back but it was like well it was the end of the game and he was just trying to make a play like it is what it is um none of that was the case it was the middle of the game the ravens were in the game and lamar jackson just didn't have good awareness and then to just add on top the try again at the end uh what, what do you mean try again like anytime a player fumbles some of it has to go in the ball carrier. It has to. You can't just exclude that. Yeah. Like, that's why fumbles don't happen often. If it was always on the defense, there's a lot of great defenders in the league. Like more J- set Jameer Gibbs fumbled in the 49ers playoff game. And part of that blame absolutely was on him. But that was an incredible defensive effort. 100%. Yeah. Where that dude like punched his arm in and fully ripped it just clean out of his hands. Yeah. Like while it was tucked. And I mean, like there was, uh, again, Jameer Gibbs in that situation was doing exactly what he could do was trying to protect the ball as much as he could. Didn't really work out. Part of that still is on him. Unfortunately, that's just how like sports works. Like yep. if you make, when like, you make plays, you get rewarded when you make mess, make up when you make mistakes. Yeah. Then you like, get sorry. Punished for that. And you just... get some flack for it. Um, this idea that Lamar is immune from criticism in that regard is there's true facets. Um, should the offensive lineman block better? Yeah. Absolutely. Did the Chiefs defender get home? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Did Lamar also have bad pocket awareness, got stripped in a big part of the game where yes. if he just holds onto the ball or runs at the pocket? Yeah. We don't have this situation? Yeah. So uh, I will not try again. I will keep doing what Because I'm doing. there's also the thing, this magical thing that more than one thing can be right at the yes. same time. That it it's can crazy. be it can be Lamar's fault, and it can also be the fault of the offensive lineman and the offensive coordinator, and they all can have blame. Imagine that. Just like Taylor Swift can still be an undercover Biden administration. Oh yes, person, and she's, she can be good for the NFL. She's a CIA asset um, that is trying to keep Biden in office and take down the deep state and take down. Or no, she's a part of the deep state. She, oh, she's a part of the deep state. She's well, a part it depends of the deep what side of well, the, what yeah, side you're looking at. Yeah, true. Um, and then fans are still mad about pass interference. Guys, we can debate all we want about if within the official rules, the pass interference against Isaiah likely in that game was a PI. I would argue on the official rule book. Yes, he was triple covered. Should it have been called now? N- yeah. Shouldn't no. it have been called? No. By the definition of the rule book. Sure. Sure. But then you're, but then you're sitting here whining about the chiefs getting ticky tack calls. And then you want the Baltimore ticky- Ravens to get a, a ticky tack call. It's and like- once again, that doesn't excuse Lam- Lamar still threw the ball in a triple coverage. That's still a bad throw if the PI doesn't happen. It's not like Isaiah likely might have had a chance and maybe he doesn't. But, but it's whatever it is. Like it's yeah. When you're looking evaluating Lamar's game, you don't be like, well, that PI wouldn't have happened. I mean, that interception wouldn't have happened if that was a PI that was called. Like, like that was thrown into triple coverage. It was like it was a horrible throw, a bad decision. 
Because let's not forget, it was underthrown. It wasn't like he threw him open into the corner of the end zone and the dude like tackled him. It was behind him with three guys converging the in ball front was of undercut. the ball. Yeah. And it was the ball was undercut by like three yards. Like Yeah, there's just no you can't sit here and say the PI was the refs getting in the way of the game and, and, and everything like that. So those are the comments, of course, as delusional as always. But keep them up, please, for the love of yeah, God. Great for content. Um, next is the disgruntled moment of the week. If it's yes. your first time with us, we say things that make made us angry, dissatisfied. Sometimes we're angry and dissatisfied. Yes. Sometimes we point out other people who are angry and dissatisfied. But I think we're both disgruntled this week. Yes, both disgruntled. Um, and Peter, you can start us off with the commanders. Just the commanders organization as a whole. What are you doing? Just genuinely, what in God's great earth are you doing? So you have... A, so you fire your head coach. Probably a good idea. Riverboat Ron was kind of finishing up his career there. He needed to be out of there. Then you look at an offensive coordinator, Eric Bieniemy, who is probably one of the best offensive coordinators in the league. He had Sam Howell throwing for nearly 4,000 yards and 21 touchdowns. Mind you, he also had 21 interceptions with uh, probably the second or third worst offensive line in the league. So... Not great, exactly. But still, the fact that he was able to throw for nearly 4,000 yards and was leading the league in passing at one point is unreal. Because we are part of the Ham Sowell fan club. Ham Sowell fan club. Get your little pins and stickers coming soon. But he's not that good kind of thing. And you look at that offensive coordinator and clearly is liked by the team. And you go with a roster that doesn't have a lot of talent with a roster that doesn't have a lot of talent. And you go, nah, get him out of here. So you hire Dan Quinn as your head coach. And it's, it's freaking Dan Quinn who doesn't have a great track record in a, in the playoffs B as a head coach. So don't really know there. And then you hire cliff Kingsbury straight off of the plane from wherever he was hiding trying to run away from he was a senior consultant on usc's offense like good lord because i guess my theory is they're trying to bait caleb williams into going there which i would think would be an awful idea because that organization is a dumpster fire we're not even going to get into the field being terrible them just getting new ownership recently that's slightly better than before like they need so much help and yeah. it just makes me so upset because you watch some of these players you watch somebody like Terry McLaurin who's been on this team for so long and they just he's too loyal to this garbage franchise yeah. to just leave i we'll, we'll do a whole bit on yeah. the di- division by division breakdown in, in the summer and after the season's over um but the commanders just don't make sense to me no. um they're interested in getting a new stadium, which is great. Will be great for the fan base. They're interested in changing the name again. They fired Eric Bieniemy and brought in Cliff Kingsbury. I like Cliff Kingsbury. I thought yeah. he would be a decent OC hire for the Eagles when they were considering him for the job. But you don't fire Eric Bieniemy for Cliff Kingsbury. That doesn't make any sense. No. It's... So now you have a staff composed of Dan Quinn, Cliff Kingsbury, and I don't even know who their DC is at this point because um, Dan Quinn's going to run that side of the ball. So. It doesn't make sense to me, not to mention Dan Quinn's defense got exposed against the Packers, like big time exposed. The commander's defense is good. They don't have the talent that the Cowboys have. And you're in a division where the Cowboys are better than you. The Eagles are better than you. And the Giants, I think, going into the year are probably better than you. Well, considering they were 2-0 and against them last year, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot they won both games. Yeah. So you're the fourth worst team in the division. You've made these drastic head coaching changes when I think you could have just promoted the enemy and it would have been fine. And now you're trying to learn Caleb Williams when you don't have the offensive line to protect him. Because you're right. They are trying to learn Caleb Williams because they want Caleb Williams to say, I will not play in a Chicago yep. Bears uniform. And then the Bears are like, well, we can't draft him. Then let's trade out of the pick. And then no one's going to want the pick because Caleb Williams doesn't want to play with their team. And then they just end up drafting like Drake May. And then Caleb Williams falls to two. And goes with the commanders and that's how the commanders want to do it that that kind of thinking isn't the thinking that you do when you're a super bowl team in the future that's a, a bad franchise that's desperation yeah you need to 
get, get a grip and like treat this like a real job like go do some scouting reports on drake may and if the commanders are interested in i mean if the bears are interested in trading the first overall pick put a package together like do something um i still don't think the commanders should pick a quarterback but that's besides the point yeah um, we'll talk about that when we talk about the draft anyway my disgruntled moment of the week yes. is my knee um <laughs> As longtime listeners of the pod, which are very few of you, will know, um, I do do a, a decent bit of running outside of the podcast, um, run for the club team here at track, do some cross country, I ran a marathon a few years ago. Um, long story short, I had a, after my marathon, I hurt my, my hip flexor and I was on and off for running. I was studying for the MCAT, doing a whole bunch of stuff and didn't get r- that much running in my schedule. Finally started building up, getting like two, three months of consistent running, getting into really good shape. All of a sudden... A week ago, my knee just starts hurting. No trauma to my knee. Like, <laughs> just started hurting. And not like, oh, it's sore. It's aching. Like, I have runner's knee. Like, no, like a stabbing pain oh, in lovely. the bottom of my kneecap type of pain. So, it's gotten a little bit better after four days off. And we'll see. I have a track meet on Saturday. Oh, I haven't run be in four days because my knee hurts. And so, yeah, I'm just a little disgruntled because after... <laughs> all that after all this time off after i like rip myself apart running this marathon my knee is just like randomly hurt and i wish i wish like i had felt fallen or something i could have been like well i fell that's why my knee hurts you just have no idea oh it's sore i just need to rest it a little bit i'm like i have no idea (laughs) what happened to my knee like a pain that i've never experienced before um but yeah so a little disgruntled about that um just a little insight to my personal life that you didn't ask for. Um, <laughs> that's it. Usually Raj has a great disgruntled moment of the week, but he's not here. So, Well, his disgruntled moment is the fact that he's not here. Yeah, and exactly. Has the flu. Um, and the fact that he said the Chiefs were going to get exit like exit in the first round of the playoffs. Whatever. Um, yeah. Next, the Pro Bowl. Um, of course, we didn't have any games to react to this weekend because, let's be honest, the flag football game in the Pro Bowl is not a game to react to. Eli Manning is currently 2-0 and against Tom Brady in the Super Bowl and 2-0 and against Peyton Manning in the Pro Bowl. That's crazy. Um, but Pro Bowl happened. Um, Peter wrote, players had fun. That's what it looked like. Um, from uh, like all the different events that they were doing and stuff, it really looked like the players were genuinely just having fun. And I know that a lot of fans are kind of like, oh, well, it's not entertaining. It's not entertaining, whatever. Well, at the end of the day, like the pro bowl should almost be a reward for players. I feel like, because like if you're being recognized by the fans as like one of the best players in the league. Now, obviously this is by the fans. This is literally a popularity contest. This is not the best players in the league. Those usually go to the all pros, but you know, it's nice to see players be happy. Like it's, it's not that serious. It's where they can literally just go out and have fun because at the end of the day, it's a game. So it's like, okay, we can get to see that like there are these all these young guys that are out there like mid 20s to like early to mid 30s, all very all seem like very likable people, like just having a good time out there and, you know, trying their best. It was the first time we've seen Jalen Hurts smile in like months like that's really saying something yeah. <laughs> like if like we need to keep this Pro Bowl indefinitely if we got Jalen Hurts to smile because that dude. I don't think cracked a smile once the entire season. Like not a once. I don't think so. Not once. So I think it was a good job by the NFL. Yeah. I even mean, though it wasn't obviously no one really watched it per se, but it looks like the players have fun. So yeah. I think it's good for them. Media needs to start realizing that the Pro Bowl isn't for your entertaining pleasure. Football is not a game where you can have an all star game type of event because it involves hitting people. Yeah. It's a and contact sport. People love the physicality of football and you can't replicate that in a Pro Bowl type of environment. So let the players have fun. It's a good trip for them to go to Hawaii. Nope. Or Orlando. They're in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. They're also, in Florida now, but send it back to Hawaii. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, but it's a good excuse for them to get away into some warm weather, have fun with their fellow players. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. I don't watch it. That's fine. I just saw some of the clips. Yep. Dexter yeah. Lawrence had a fun time. Everybody likes him. Justin so. Tucker won tic-tac-toe. Yeah. Um, Jason but, Kelsey used physics on a sled. I didn't even see the Jason Kelsey clip. Yeah, it was like he was like moving up and down on the sled to help them like whatever. It yeah. doesn't matter. <laughs> so I yeah, I just the whole thing about like, oh, the Pro Bowl is not worth watching. Like they don't watch it. Yeah, no one cares. Like you're just giving it attention by talking it on about yeah. it on your talk show. Exactly. And you could say we're doing the same thing, except we're not hating on the Pro Bowl. We're praising it. Yep. Looks like fun. I wish I could do that. That, that looks like fun. I like obstacle courses. There was one random quarterback that was there. I'm trying to figure. Oh, Gardner Minshew. Gardner Minshew was there. That was so funny. 
that is that dude. Sometimes legend. I think they should just like let less quarterbacks into the Pro Bowl. Like nah, you, send them all. When in. you let Mac Jones and Gardner Minshew, and I'm just like, bro, I saw Seahawks fans calling Geno Smith a terrorist. Was he there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, what does the Pro Bowl come to? Anyway, um, we're on to the Super Bowl. We didn't talk about it last week, of course, because we were saving it all for this podcast. So this is officially the Super Bowl preview, the last game of the year. The last time we can bet on this football oh for a long time. We got the Chiefs versus the 49ers in a rematch of the 2019 Super Bowl. 2019 season. Yeah, yeah. 2019 we, it was season. in 2020. Super Bowl. So this is like right before the pandemic too, which is like wild. Yeah. Um, so the Chiefs, we'll start with them and their kind of narrative going into this. And then we'll, we'll give our predictions at the end. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, the Chiefs advanced their fourth Super Bowl in six years. And the question is, are they a dynasty before this game even starts? Yeah, I mean, because this is, well, so in Mahomes' time as, yes, this is going to be Mahomes glazing, I'm sorry. Um, In Mahomes' time as a starter, he has gone to six AFC Championship games in six years as a starter. They've gone to the Super Bowl four times. They currently have won it twice, have a chance to win it three times and go three and one in a six-year stretch. The fact that they even made the Super Bowl this year after everybody was counting them out, I feel like they are a dynasty, but maybe not of the, to the same caliber as we've seen before. Like, obviously, the only thing to really compare it to in modern day is the Patriots dynasty, but that's a whole separate thing because they were doing that for 20 years. But if you look at like a run that the Patriots had, let's say it's like the 2014 to 2018 run, like, they did basically the exact same thing as that. And we considered that a dynasty. So I think they are. And I think they have the potential to keep going. Um, I don't think they're of the same caliber as other dynasties. But I think right now it would be really, really stupid to say that they're not a dynasty yet. Yeah, I agree. I think the record speaks for itself. Also, when you consider dynasties in the modern NFL, I think this will really stand out. We've seen teams, if you go through it, the 49ers made the Super Bowl in 2019. This is their first time back in 2024. Yeah. Um, well, it was 2020. So keeping things even. So it's been four years since they've been back in the Super Bowl. After the 49ers, it was the Buccaneers. Then it was the Rams. Then it was the Eagles. And now we're back to 49ers. So no repeats out of the NFC mm-hmm. until in the in the last four years. Um, and it's the 49ers repeating it now. Yeah. Um, which has a significant period of time. The che- team has kind of changed a lot. There's some core pieces still intact, but it's changed a lot. Um, guys like Brandon Ayuk weren't there. Brock Purdy, obviously, is not there. Um, Christian McCaffrey wasn't there. Yeah, Christian McCaffrey wasn't there. All that type of stuff. Then when you look at the AFC, you look at the past Super Bowl representees. It was the Chiefs. The Chiefs. Chiefs. Bengals. The Bengals. The, the Chiefs, Chiefs. And the Chiefs. Yeah. So when you look at that dominance, look at the NFC side of things where it's changing every single year. And then you look at the Chiefs side of things. They've consistently made the Super Bowl every year. And I think in the modern day NFL, you're not going to see a lot of repeats. A lot of things are more yep. predictable. There's a lot more energy uh, injuries. I think the game is played at a higher pace. Um, a lot of teams are really, really good. If you look at teams in the AFC, we talked about it's how a bloodbath. four teams had a path this year to get to the Super Bowl on that side. Like you think the Bills, the Ravens, the Chiefs, and you can make an argument for the Texans or the Browns or these other talented mm-hmm. teams that could provide upsets. Um, they were all in that division. Like, there's a lot of talent around the league, and you think about a team like the Bengals and the Jaguars who went into the year where you thought they could be a contender to get to the Super Bowl, and they just if, got obliterated with injuries. Yeah, if things broke right, and they got obliterated by injuries, and the game happens where they're not as good as we thought. Um, people thought the Chargers would be a good team. Like, you, there's so many good teams in the NFL right now, so much good talent, and the Chiefs for the past six years have just consistently showed up every the, single year in the biggest game of the year. The only time they didn't. <laughs> Um, the two years they didn't make the Super Bowl, they lost in overtime in the AFC Championship game. Mm-hmm. Like we're talking that close to getting to another Super Bowl. Yeah, maybe you win one of those. Now you're going for a ring four. So obviously it didn't happen, but I think you have to consider them a dynasty, especially when you look at what the NFC side of things has done. Yeah, like you just keep running into the Chiefs in the Super Bowl, and the NFC is like playing. You can go this year, you can go that year because mm-hmm. it's really hard to make the Super Bowl, and I think people. Don't think about that. Um, guys have been done playing football since early January. 
in the regular season. Yeah. Guys like um, Jalen Hurts was done January 15th and Patrick Mahomes is going to be playing on February 11th. So it's almost an, an extra month of football yep. at a high level. And then you have to start the season again yep. and do it all again. And you have coordinators and players leave and you have to rebuild trust with all of them and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. So all that to say is that um, the Chiefs every single year, despite making the Super Bowl, keep showing back, keep showing up and, and doing it again. So, yep. yeah, I would consider them a dynasty. And then there that brings go. the role. I mean, I guess that brings up the idea of the villain role. Yeah. Is, yeah. I love how they're embracing it. They, gee, look at that. Somebody actually had a decent take saying that the Chiefs were the villains. Who would have guessed? You can check um, our Instagram for yeah, that. I wonder I wonder who said that one. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, terrifying, personally, um, because for <clears throat> a long time, they were, the Chiefs were kind of like that young up and coming team that was going to, you know, take down the Patriots. They were going to take down the next one. But of course, you know, the die a hero, <laughs> or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Yep. So... They, I think, now have finally he embraced that villain role, and they don't care. And I think they're honestly going to be better for it because there's that clip of Travis Kelsey where like people start booing him, and he's like getting all fired up. Or even Mahomes is like starting to chirp a little bit more, like even just to the fans and stuff. It's like, oh god, they're going to be playing better now, aren't they? Yep. <laughs> like when you think of guys in this team who have been there the whole time, Chris Jones, Travis Kelsey, Patrick Mahomes, leaders in the locker room, probably mm-hmm. like. McKinnon and um, Clyde Edwards Lair has been there for a while. And even the, just that offensive line in general. The offensive line, yeah. You know that they're pissed. Like every, this whole entire year, it's been like the Chiefs are old news. They're Chiefs not good enough news. this Chiefs year. Chiefs are old news, yeah. Um, and they're excited for it. I mean, you can see Travis is fired up. He said that he doesn't want to win another trophy more this year than yeah. like any other year. Um, this trophy matters more. And that I think that's a huge motivating factor for them. And I'm Happy they're embracing the villain role. It's the role that almost every team tried to play against the Chiefs in the previous years. You think of the Bengals being like, "Oh, we're the villains, Burrowhead, yeah, like Burrowhead. yeah, we're trying to chirp them, yeah, um, whatever." Yeah, we dominate Burrowhead, and it's the Bills, like, "Oh, they can't play in uh they can't play in Buffalo, they can't they play can't. in Buffalo," yeah. and and now the Chiefs are just like, "Cool, count us out again." Yeah, because the first time they were like underdogs in Buffalo, it's kind of like, "Oh, that's kind of disrespectful." Yeah, but, like it is what it is. Yeah, you know, first road game for the chiefs ever mm-hmm. and then it happened again versus the ravens where they were reminder four and a half point underdogs yeah and they won the game outright and now again one more time they're they're underdogs and they're underdogs it's not by much it's only by like one or two points yeah they're still dogs and yep. it's i don't know what vegas is looking at they must just be looking at everything on paper and just really assuming that like okay the 49ers are going to be able to figure this out um because it's just it's really scary do you so you think the chiefs should be favored i do i honestly with how because the 49ers let's not forget they they let up what 24 points in the first half against the the lions like the, yes they came all the way back but there was also some stupid crap that happened in that yep. game they were within one score of the packers they with some interceptions that should have been caught from the dropped, defensive side. Yeah. yeah, like dropped interceptions in both of those games. Like, I think if those hit the Chiefs defensive backs, they're not dropping those. Like, it's I, I Granted, just Nick Bolton did drop up a bad game. pick. Yeah. yeah, that would have been that might have been a pick six right there. Yep. but um, we'll also forget that when we talk about Lamar's game that he had. Yeah, right? yeah, we'll yeah. forget that one. Um. Yeah, it's just if you look at those teams and just how they're built, it, it it's hard for me to look at Mahomes and go, yeah, he should be the underdog. Because everybody's doing this narrative of how, oh, well, the Chiefs are the villains, but then why are they the underdog? Like you can't yeah. be both. You can't be the team that has to that everybody has to try to beat and then that, be the underdog. Everyone's like, God, I don't want to see the Chiefs here again. Everyone's yeah. like, this is the Super Bowl we don't want. But the Chiefs are still the underdogs. They're still, Everyone yeah. is like, oh, of course the Chiefs are going to win. It's uh, Taylor Swift it's and Travis rigged, whatever, Kelsey whatever. and then, all this. Then why is Vegas giving them points? Yeah. And I understand the 49ers better roster. You have time to prepare. Injuries will even itself out a little bit. The Chiefs have some more key injuries they're going to have to work through. But again, if you just look on paper, the 49ers 
got destroyed by the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah. Annihilated at home. And what happened in that game? Random crap didn't go the 49ers way. Yep. It was tipped passes that ended up getting picked. That sounds like something the Chiefs could do. And the Chiefs beat the Ravens. So I just think by basic like math properties, just basic arithmetic, basic arithmetic, you've got the Chiefs over the Ravens. And then when you, I mean, over the 49ers. And then when you look deeper, you think, okay, Patrick Mahomes versus Brock Purdy. All right, that's a big advantage, Mahomes. Like, you know, he's going to show up in the Super Bowl. Yeah. The 49ers defensive line hasn't been that much better that good recently. The Chiefs offensive line is holding it together. Travis Kelsey looks better. Rasheed Rice, potential yeah, the, receiver number one. The 49ers let up 100, like 60 or 180 yards rushing. Isaiah Pacheco's a dog. And then let's look. So we look at, I guess, we'll take a sidebar and then we'll get back to the questions we have there. But let's look at both teams' path. We kind of did this with you a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To the, to the Super Bowl. The Chiefs played the fourth coldest game in NFL history yep. and completely handled the Dolphins no problem. Yep. The game was never in doubt except for the Tyree kill first touchdown and made 7-7. Yep. After that, nothing was ever in doubt. Next game, they are underdogs going into Buffalo for their first road playoff game. Buffalo is coming off the backs of like eight or nine straight wins. Yeah. It's not eight. It might have been seven or eight. But the Chiefs handle that game. We've talked about it on the pod. I think it was cl- the score was closer than the game really was. Yeah. The Chiefs always felt like they had that game. Four and a half point dogs to the Ravens on the road. This is the team that beat the 49ers that were going to win the Super Bowl with the unanimous MV- almost two time unanimous MVP, Lamar Jackson. The Chiefs won the game. Yep. That's how they got to the Super Bowl. Now let's look at the 49ers who started this, the thing with the first round uh, bye. Yep. Then they got to play the seven seed Packers in which it took um, their kicker, the Packers kicker, missing a field goal to tie that game up or make it make it so that the 49ers had to do more to tie the game up. Yep. There were dropped interceptions. Uh, and- the 49ers had to come down and do a game scoring drive. And not that I don't give them credit for it. But that was a team they should have handled, and that a, a team that the Chiefs did handle in the Dolphins. Oh, and not to mention the fact that Jordan Love had the ball at the end of the game. Yes. And with the way it was looking, if he doesn't make that bad throw, if he doesn't force that, there might be overtime. There could be overtime. Yeah. And again, I just think if you take the Packers and the Dolphins, I think they're on a similar enough level where we can say, well, the Chiefs were certainly more impressive in that Dolphins yep. game than the 49ers were in that Packers game, but you know what? They escaped their rusty first round by. I'll give it to you. Now, instead of facing the Cowboys, they face the Lions, who we all know has secondary issues. Yep. And they're down 17 at halftime, just getting obliterated. Yeah. And you give them credit for the comeback. But Absolutely. They, Why did you even go down that much took, in the first place? It took a throw off a helmet. Yeah, a Catch. bounce. Yeah, an interception that easily should have been caught that c- bounced into the hands of the receiver, who then caught it at like the two. And Jameer Gibbs fumbled. That was yep. huge. Um, Dan Campbell made some really bad, questionable bad coaching gambles, decisions. Like if he just kicks field goals, they win the game. Um, and I understand that all sounds like a lot of ifs and buts. And well, if those things didn't happen, that's football. Yes, but I can promise you. The Chiefs are not going to make those mistakes. And I obviously, I'm sure I'm coming off as what team I'm going to pick in this game. <laughs> Gee, but I wonder. we're talking about why they're the underdogs. And it's just, they beat, they had a more impressive run. And the 49ers kind of had to rely on some mistakes to happen to get where they are. Mm-hmm. And a little bit of luck. And the Chiefs are not going to, those factors are going to be in the Chiefs' favor because they don't make mistakes. They've been on mm-hmm. the stage before and they know what it takes. Yeah. But what do they need to do specifically this game to win? So I think for this game specifically, it's you have to shut down big plays on defense. You can't let anything go over the top. You can't let any big Debo Samuel runs or Brandon Ayuk big plays or George Kittle. And I think they got the secondary to do that. And they need to shut down the run game, period. Because they need to force Brock Purdy to throw the ball. And not throw the ball as in like, oh, he's just throwing it in time and rhythm. He needs to try to win this game. Because if you're putting that in Brock Purdy's hands, I don't know if he can truly win a game like that. Like Patrick Mahomes can. And on the offensive side of the ball, it's pound the 
rock. The 49ers run defense has been atrocious recently. You got to pound the rock. As long as you bring a fullback in, I don't care. Isaiah Pacheco, fall forward for like four or five yards every play. Like, if you pound this team, they are going to lose. Like, I don't, I, this is so strange because for the entire season, I've been hyping up how great the 49ers defense is because they are, they have great pieces. But up front, it's just very strange, especially in their defensive tackles. They get moved off of the ball in the run game. And now, of course, this is these are all a lot of hypotheticals, whatever. But I think if the Chiefs can establish a run game early and then they would like just essentially just pick apart those like shorter passing games, move down the field, just continue to keep pressure on the 49ers. And if they're able to take out big plays and they're able to at least they don't need to fully. I know I said they got to fully stop the run game, but like you're not going to fully contain Christian McCaffrey for four quarters, but contain the run game enough that you don't give them enough time to score. I think that the Chiefs can pretty handedly win that. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. Get party under pressure early yep. when he drops back and commit to the run. And I would just let your cornerbacks hold up in single coverage until the 49ers can prove that they're going to connect on those and pick you apart for doing single coverage, man-to-man coverage on the back end. Um, Don't let McCaffrey run all over you. The Chiefs run defense is not great. Um, I would do a similar game plan that you had against the The Ravens. Ravens. Um, Running quarterback Brock Purdy moved really well against the Lions. I'll give him a ton of credit for his scrambling. Um, Let him try to make those plays, see if he's comfortable doing it in a big stage in the Super Bowl, Mm -hmm. and commit to the run. And if Debo and Ayuk start picking apart Snead and McDuffie in that secondary, then you can consider, hey, we need to drop people or try playing a little yeah, bit more we need zone. To switch into a zone, whatever. We'll give up those like the the McCaffrey runs, but we just can't let the deep balls go over. Yeah, Pur- Purdy hasn't been good in two first halves. So get yeah. him under pressure early and get them behind the eight ball. I know they've come back twice mm-hmm. in recent games, but this is still a team that has a very poor record being down in the fourth quarter. And the Chiefs are not going to lose if they're up in the fourth quarter. Yeah. So I would just, again, get put pressure on the run in the pass early. Like pressure, pressure, pressure. That's what Steve Spagnuolo is really good at. Yeah. Sending corner blitzes and stuff. And then just say, guys, hold up on the back end. We'll send help. And yep. you know what? Sneed's going to let, let up a bad PI at some point in the game. Deal with it. Yeah. Someone's going to get burned like they did in the Ravens game when Zay Flowers with a touchdown. Deal with Deal it. With it. But enough times pressuring Purdy, someone is going to make a mistake. There's going to be a fumble. There's going to be an interception. Yeah. And when the Chiefs win the turnover battle, because I'm convinced the Chiefs are not turning the ball over. I don't think Mahomes is throwing an interception. And then we're going to be relying on fumbles. And Pacheco doesn't fumble the ball much. And um, unless we have a McCole Hardman weird play. Or uh, God forbid, Kadarius Tony sees the field. Yeah. Um, so I think that's how you win the game if you're the Chiefs. Um, less room for error. But let's go to the 49ers. Because we've been, we've been glazing the Chiefs a lot. Yep, we've been glazing the Chiefs. But let's be clear. The 49ers should not be counted out of this game. 100% not. Not by a long shot. Now, do we think the Chiefs are the better team? Yes. But can the 49ers win this game? Yes, absolutely they can. Yep. By doing what? Literally the exact opposite of what we just said. Yeah, because <laughs> um, the 49ers are healthy. Yeah, like we're, relatively. The one big injury is going to be to Hafunga that they don't yeah. have. And we, we, you can see that it's a glaring issue because the run defense is. has been bad and he comes up well and absolutely on the run game. But they're healthier. They have more rest because remember, yes. they only played two playoff games and they're the favorites on paper and they're the favorites because they have the better roster. They have the overall, both of their, like when you look at both of their rosters, the 49ers is a better roster, period. You can argue they, ha- you can argue they have the better offensive line the better receivers, the better running back, and the better tight end. You can make all fair arguments for that. Uh, and better linebackers. Oh, I was just saying on the offense. Oh, just on end. offense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when you go on defense, you can argue they have the better linebackers. And that Secondary might... is not better, but maybe you could argue for a front four. Yeah, I think you could. I think it's an easy argument, yeah. Yeah. Bosa, um, Bosa Hargrave, Hargrave um, uh, Tariq. Chase Young, if he wants to play. Uh, good Lord. Yeah, he's going to get benched. Um, and then I believe it's uh, Kinlaw. Yeah, I think is their other guy. So, yeah, you can easily make the argument that the 49ers are better on their in their units. Um, but do you think? Well, I think we both don't think they do. But 
do they have what it takes to beat the Chiefs? I think they, they do. They have the pieces to beat the Chiefs. Absolutely, they do. They if if there was a team that could go out there and beat the Chiefs, it would be this 49ers team. They have a great run game. The Chiefs' run game is not good. It's it was like twenty third or something. Yep. Like that. It's not that great. And they are if they're able to essentially do what we were just saying for the Chiefs, where they establish a run game early, kind of pick apart the secondary by those short, quick passes, move down the field, keep pressure on them. And for a defense, it's going to be hard to get Patrick Mahomes to turn the ball over. But the second that he like, and you got to keep a spy on him too, which is going to be hard. But you know, you got to double Kelsey. You got to like just force force players like MVS, force players like. Sky Moore, force players like, I don't know, God forbid, Canarius Tony, force those players to beat you because I would put my money saying, look, if we're going to double Kelsey, we're going to put our best corner on Rasheed Rice and we're going to keep our linebackers in the box to watch for Pacheco coming out of the backfield and keep Mahomes in the pocket. I'm willing to let MVS and Sky Moore try to beat me because I don't think they will. Yeah, if you're the 49ers and you lose the Super Bowl because some deep passes happen to the Chiefs receivers because you left them in single coverage. Yeah. That I think you could live with yourself. What you can't do is what the Eagles did last year, yes. where you're getting these dumb little two-yard out routes that score touchdowns yeah. or short underneath throws that go for 30 yards and you get to a touchdown zone or kick a field goal. That's what you can't do if you're the 49ers. Yeah. You have to stop the run, help you out your run defense, yep. and don't let the little stuff kill you. Let them make big plays. And if you have to adjust from there, go there. But again, MBS has shown up this playoff series so far. Rasheed yeah. Rice has obviously, Travis Kelsey has obviously, but still, they didn't play, they didn't have great seasons. Say, just say in your game plan, we don't think you're going to make those big plays in the Super Bowl. Yes. And if it happens, if it happens, oh a, well. Oh well, you did what you could. But you can't let them just nickel you and dime you down the field. You have to lose the game based on. Like essentially, it'll come down to: Is Mahomes going to make plays that nobody else can? And if that's how you lose, he's that's he's how one you of lose. the greatest quarterbacks we've ever seen. You just yeah, but you can't lose the game just based on easy things that any team could do. Because if you're the 49ers, you're going to be kicking yourself if the Chiefs run the ball on first down, get five yards. They throw a little out route for three yards. It's third and two. They run the ball first down. Okay, then they throw a six seven yard pass. Close to a first down, they get the first down again. And they just keep taking these 13 play drives, yeah. eight minutes, and they score a touchdown at the end. And then your offense has to come out and respond with a touchdown because you're not confident you're going to yeah. stop the Chiefs. Yeah. You can't let that happen. If I see a 50 yard MBS catch, Fine. it is what it is. Um, they absolutely have what it takes, yes. they have great talent. Um, if there's a offensive line that can slow, maybe the Chiefs rush down it would be 49ers have a decent offensive line i know they haven't been playing great but they have really good skill position players yep and that team when they got rolling against the lions they looked great i was just about to say like for as much as we were kind of dogging on them they came back in both of those games they were counted out at halftime and they came back and won both of those games so this is a team that you have to put away it's not a team that you can like let the gas up and this is a team that, like, depending on who gets the ball at whatever half, like, you can't just, like, I don't think this is where the Chiefs can just score 17 points and win the game. No. And just, like, sit on their back foot and say, oh, well, the defense carried and, us. And Andy Reid has been scheming all these two weeks. Like, you know yeah. the Chiefs are getting at least 14 points based on scheme and weird plays alone. Yeah. And, you know, I think, obviously, I think it's it's hard to beat a team twice, especially in the Super Bowl twice. But... I think that really this game comes down to Kyle Shanahan versus Steve Spagnola. That is realistically the matchup of the entire game. Um, because if Shanahan is able to come up with creative enough plays that can freeze those players and find the gaps in, cause there's always going to be gaps in a defense because that there, you could only have 11 players. You can only cover so much field. And if he's able to figure that out, then I think that they could win this game. But the issue is that Steve Spagnuolo is literally one of the best defensive coordinators we've seen probably the modern era. Mm -hmm. And you know what? You know what Steve Spagnuolo is going to do. 
he's going to send pressure. He's going to blitz from weird spots. And not that it makes it easy to scheme against, but you need to know that you need to be able to beat the blitz. Brock Purdy needs to get the ball out. You need to make creative game plans to get out of those. And the thing is, is that the what what trips teams up a lot is that Spectrum is known for the blitz. But then the issue is that when they drop random players back in coverage, and then yep. somebody else blitzing, and it's like a it's a stunt or it's it's a when you simulated drop Nick pressure. Bolton back in coverage, and Trent McDuffie's coming off like the nickel. And, and yeah, and Trent McDuffie's coming off the nickel, and then it's um, Christian McCaffrey's on the wrong side because why the hell would a slot corner be blitzing? Oh well, now Brock Purdy's put on a island t-shirt and UCL then snapped in half yeah, it just gets obliterated and the spine gets Sam Darnold out, gets yeah. MVP of the Super Bowl. Oh my god, what are the what are the Sam Darnold odds for Super Bowl okay, MVP? The Sam Darnold odds are concerningly high for Wait, MVP. What? Like, look, look, like, sorry, they're concerningly like good. They're like, you're kind of like, shouldn't it be lower? Because you would think backup quarterback comes in and gets Super Bowl MVP. Everybody's been talking about it. Everybody's like, but if he got in, yeah. they'd win. I'm like, okay, stop talking about it. No, no one's like, I don't even know who the backup quarterback for the Chiefs is, but no one's talking about that fool yeah. winning Super Bowl MVP. But it's like Sam Darnold has a shot. Like, well, because okay, Brock Purdy got injured one time, and then now it's like, oh, it's the end. He's injury prone. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think it's a huge matchup between Shanahan and Spagnola. Kyle Shanahan is in a big spot here. He's got a second. lot to prove. Is it second Super Bowl? There's been a lot of questions about him trailing. And I really do think the 49ers, I know they've trailed twice in these playoff games. They are going to trail versus the Chiefs. Reason number one, if the Chiefs get the ball first, they scored like every, they've scored on like eight straight opening drives in the playoffs in Super Bowl. Yeah. Like they usually have stuff dialed up well on the first drive. They're going to get a field goal or touchdown. So you're instantly going to trail if you lose the toss. If you win the toss, then you have to go score right away or else the Chiefs are going to come down and score. So you're likely at some point in the game going to be behind and you need to be able to play out of that stay true to yourself and you're going to have to trust Brock Purdy to make big throws down the field that don't get bounced off of court of yep. cornerbacks helmets so I'll be interested to see what he does I think it's gonna be a bad look for Shanahan if he loses he's gonna get dragged through the mud if he loses this because what this is gonna be well he he is partially to blame for the 28 to 3 loss Against the Falcons because oh, he was the offensive coordinator. coordinator. They didn't put up any points, right? Or they got to 31, maybe? They got to, th- yeah, they kicked a field goal, I think. Yeah. So then he's going to be partially responsible for that. Then he's going to have lost to the Chiefs, having a whatever point lead in the third quarter. 10 point lead with Jimmy point, Garoppolo, yeah. Yeah, 10 point lead with Jimmy Garoppolo. And then now he would have lost another Super Bowl. Yeah, not that we would be like he's getting fired. But no, he, uh, he should not get fired for making the Super Bowl. Let's be abundantly clear. But. <laughs> Legacy wise, ugh, that's going to be tough. He almost starts to fall in that Mike McCarthy class a little bit, where you're like, I know he's made the Super Bowl, and McCarthy only has like one Super Bowl appearance, but yeah. you start to just be like, or he has two. Um, but you start to be like, hmm, like the, the, you're, there's this barrier that you're not quite, yeah, quite reaching. Um, so I guess do we go through weird stat? We'll go through weird stats first, yeah. and then we'll make our predictions. Um, Peter, you made these and found yes. these stats. So I'll uh, let you take it so- away. Basically, these uh, a lot of sports bad, a lot of degenerate sports betters. Uh, we're looking at such as myself, such as himself. Uh, we're looking at stats uh, for teams uh, against the spread, and uh, well, the issue is that the 49ers are not looking great in this case because <laughs> teams with a better record since 2000, which is a pretty small sample size, all things considered. But yeah, it's 24 Super Bowls. It's 24. Like it's it's a decent number. Um, so teams with a better record. Are two and sixteen against the spread, and are six and twelve straight up. And then teams with a higher seed are two and fifteen, or two fifteen and two against the spread. So the f- and people might say against the spread, well, the spread's two and a half. But then the option is one point, and if you're or one or point two vi- point victory, and you don't like that, like against the spread, you're thinking, okay, it might be a three point swing. Yeah. Three point swing means the Chiefs win. It means the Chiefs win. So the 49ers both have the better record and the higher seed. So it's not looking great, at least all things considered. Now, of course, there are those exceptions. There are those two win teams in there. So I I don't know. I really, really don't know if those are looking great for the 49ers, but I mean 
how are the Chiefs getting points in this game, man? How are they the underdogs? And well, before we get into our predictions, well, I wanted to mention the one more thing about the Chiefs being the underdogs. They have all they've done this year after winning the Super Bowl and being a better team is like there's this narrative that they've lost a lot. Again, the only receiver they lost from last year's team was Juju Smith Schuster. And he was cool and he helped the team out a lot. He was um, Mr. Third Down. But they replaced him with Rasheed Rice, who is inarguably a better receiver at this point than Juju was. Yeah. So the receiving court might only be worse by Travis Kelsey slightly regressing from last year. Yeah. So they have the same receiving core. Their defense got better and everything else kind of just stayed the same. Yeah. And they won the Super Bowl last year against a good Eagles team. It's not like, yeah, the Eagles team last year, let's be very clear. They were significantly better than they were this year. And they were like the third overall favorites to go back and win the Super Bowl again this year going into the year. Yep. So a good Eagles team, they beat in the Super Bowl last year. They come in this year with a better team. People are doubting them. Doesn't look great. They're back in the Super Bowl. Like, all they've done is do what people have asked them to, and they're still being underdogs. So regardless of who you think is going to win the game, of course, the 49ers have a shot. I do think it's incredibly disrespectful and just wrong for the Chiefs not to be favored in this game. And people could say, well, listen, like that's like that's the, what the public's going to bet on. Vegas is obviously looking at things that are better than that. The public has been so good at predicting these games this year. Like Vegas has done quite bad at setting lines and money lines for these games because they're looking at it almost like too logically where the public is like, wait, hold on. Patrick Mahomes is getting points against these teams. And it's it's just because like the, there's been weird things that have happened this year, yes, but they're doubting the wrong players. They're putting their faith in people like Brock Purdy. Like, you want to know why the 49ers haven't covered any spread in the playoffs yet so far? Is because they're not a playoff performing team. They've gotten away with their exceedingly better talent than these other teams, and quite frankly, some dumb luck. So the Chiefs have not had any of that. Not so. to mention Mahomes is also nine and three as an underdog. Yes, and that's why I've been like, I've been saying that against the spread. But and still. I've been saying that every single week as we sit here. That he's nine and he's like nine. Oh, one. sorry, outright record nine and three as an yeah. underdog. He's outright nine and three against as an underdog. He's like something like twelve one and one against the spread as an underdog. And again, it's relevant because they're only underdogs by two and a half points so if you're going to cover the spread you're basically going to win unless it's a one point game and in a one point game you're just you throw your hands up it's pretty much a wash it's hard to predict so i just think the fact that they're underdogs the chiefs is ridiculous and i think vegas as we'll hear in my super bowl prediction segment is going to be made a fool of again for the third straight week on that but now it's time to make our official predictions the last prediction we will have in the 2023-2024 NFL season. I'm sure it's very clear who we're going to pick to win the Super Bowl. But we'll do it in a way that we actually make our final predictions in pen and give yes. a few key reasons why. So, Peter, I'll let you go first. Who is taking home the Vince Lombardi Trophy this year? It's going to be the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't think anybody's surprised. We've been glazing the Chiefs for so long during this entire podcast. But... At the end of the day, we are, I think we are about to witness a dynasty being formed. Like, and I know I just said they're already a dynasty, but it's about to be cemented even further. Because watching the Chiefs adopt, like, this is just like even beyond what, you know, you could look at all the stats, you could look at all this, whatever. Just the feeling of it, this is like the Chiefs' time to ascend. Like, this is them becoming the villains. This is them becoming the dynasty. This is them becoming the team that everybody wants to beat. And it just, I was talking about, you know, Team of Destiny for the Lions, which they were so close, but CJ Garner Johnson just decided to wave, but whatever. Um, I think that this is kind of the team that they aren't playing scared, they have so much experience. And it just, it feels like they're going to win this game. And, you know, the 49ers, they talk a big game, whatever, but I think they're a little bit scared. And I know the 49ers faithful is going to come at me for that. I, I think they're a little bit worried about this game. Chiefs, I how many? Four. I'm, of course, picking the Chiefs <laughs> now. 
I said the 49ers were going to win the Super Bowl before the point. Like, I actually predicted the Super Bowl, and so did Peter yeah. in the beginning of this whole playoff prediction. I know people keep saying that we are like bad at making picks. Like, no, we actually predicted this. this but... um, I did say the 49ers were going to win the Super Bowl. That's before I watched them in the playoffs. And I think this is where everybody's overvaluing what the 49ers have done in the playoffs. They have been lucky to be in these games and t- come away with wins. Again, the Brock Purdy like off the helmet catch is a ridiculous play that went in their favor that 100% made a big difference in them coming back down 17 points. Yep. Not to mention a Jameer Gibbs fumble, which of course is part of the game, but I'll get into that in a second. Then against the Packers, they didn't look all that good as they as they drop like Packers dropped interceptions. It took missed kicks yeah. and uh, Jordan love turning into bad Brett Favre on the last play of the drive to get away with that win. Not to mention they got destroyed by the Baltimore Ravens in their biggest game of the season during that. Also the chiefs have played in the last two rounds, better teams than the 49ers have. The bills were better than the lions and the Ravens were better than the Packers. I think the Bills are better than the Pack. Like, I think across the board, the Chiefs have played the better playoff teams to get to this point, and they've beaten them all. Yet somehow, we think the 49ers are going to win this game. Because I know for sure, for the most part, the 49ers are going to make more mistakes in this game than the Kansas City Chiefs will. Patrick Mahomes is unlikely to throw an interception. Brock Purdy, I think, is more likely to throw an interception, fumble the ball, make crucial mistakes on play. And that's going to be the difference. It was the difference in the Ravens game. And people are talking, yeah. like, people are not talking about it enough. The Chiefs won the game because the Ravens turned the ball over, count it three times, and the Chiefs never turned the ball over. Yeah. So in this game, where there's going to be a lot of high scoring offense, mm-hmm. and a lot of big plays, and a, you're going to need to have one play that switches the momentum of the game. It's going to be Brock Purdy throwing the ball to Legereus Sneed because he's under pressure and kind of has to just chuck it. Yeah. And Patrick Mahomes is going to dink and duck, get rid of the ball, take a sack when he needs to so he doesn't fumble the ball, and the Chiefs are going to win by seven. Dang. Okay. I like You're giving ju- them seven? I just think they're the better team. Okay. Like I All right. This difference at quarterbacks, like I'm not even trying to be a Brock Purdy hater. It's just I don't see the way in which and again like the, the 49ers run defense has been as we noted yeah bad recently their um offensive line has been worse recently and then i think we're all we're undervaluing the chiefs cornerbacks their linebackers are going to be healthy again yep andy reed off a weak arrest they're two and they're two yeah. and one in the super bowl shanahan's oh and one in the super bowl the Chiefs get it, and we're all going to be sitting here wondering why we all thought the Chiefs weren't going to get past the Bills in the second round as they hold their back-to-back Lombardi trophy. We're all going to be sitting here on next Tuesday talking about if Patrick Mahomes is already the second-best quarterback of all time. Oh, my God. Which he will be on next Tuesday. Wow. And we're going to see Taylor Swift and Brittany Mahomes drunk at the Chiefs parade <laughs> oh my God. on Wednesday, and everybody's going to hate it. But it's what's gonna happen, dude. I'm t- okay. Just for just for entertainment's sake, Taylor Swift. I know you're not watching this, but it would be really funny if you kissed the Lombardi Trophy. I'm telling you right now, <laughs> you got the chance to piss off the most irritating people on the planet. Please do it. It would be so funny. <laughs> Travis coming up to the mic, being like, "We did this, Taylor. We did, we this. did this. You did this." <laughs> just make people so mad. <laughs> Good Lord. Oh, my God. So those are our predictions. We're riding with the Chiefs. I know it comes off as a lot of glazing, but I feel like I've read the Chiefs like a book this postseason. Yeah. I've been riding with them. I've predicted some scores wrong, but I've been riding with them all postseason, and I feel more confident in the Chiefs beating the 49ers than I do the Chiefs beating, honestly, the Bills or the Ravens, to yep. be truthful. Um, I just don't think the 49ers have looked like a good team, and I think they're scared. I really, like you said, I think they're scared. Because I think they're they're playing to not lose. The Chiefs are playing to win. Yep, a hundred percent. Yeah, they don't want to lose that football game. No. All right, that was cool. Super Bowl predictions. Cool. But last week we were going to go over new head coaching hires, but we never got to it. So we're going to do it now. Yes, when we have some time. Um, so we'll start off by the Chargers signing Jim Harbaugh from Michigan. Pretty good. 
Yeah, I think good. it's good. I think it's a solid pick. I think you need you need to build a culture there. I think Jim Harbaugh. You know, he had he was a, actually as much as uh, people like to bag on him in the NFL. He had a really good record in the NFL. I actually I was doing some research because mm-hmm. I thought he was a horrible NFL coach, and I did research and I was like he's not, and I felt like there was this kind of narrative that yeah. he wasn't, and then people have been starting to talk about it like yo he's actually a really good head coach, and I was like. Oh, then why did we have this like negative perception? We, of yeah, for some reason we just had this negative connotation around him. I, I guess it was because he was very like he screamed a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was like I think it was kind of the media was sort of dragging him a little bit. But you know, if there's going to be a guy that's going to come in there, like, look, I have championship caliber rosters both in the NFL and in college. I can do it however you need me to. Like that's a guy. That's the guy you bring in. And I think for Jim Harbaugh and the Chargers organization. They have been f- like flipping between these head coaches. They're yeah. they're known for being like a shaky franchise. It doesn't spend a lot of money. Get a guy in there that you know is going to be your head coach for three, four years at a minimum. Yeah, and just be like, he's the guy. Like, there's not going to be a question after year one or year two. Do you fire Jim Harbaugh? So he's the coach you have. So if the quarterback isn't right, which everyone agrees that the quarterback is right, yeah, then you have a head coach and a quarterback that's right, and then you can fix the rest of the team. Yeah. Now we'll get into this when we talk about each team. I think people are wildly overestimating what this Jim Harbaugh move means for year one of the Chargers. Oh, God. Year one, they're not doing anything. Like, they just won five games this year. Yeah. They, by no, I, I think the win total is like nine and a half, ten yeah. and a half yeah. for the Chargers next year. I don't think people should, Chargers fans or anyone should expect the Chargers to be that good next year. Yeah. Um, They've got a lot of cap issues, a lot of personnel moves they have to make. Yeah. Also, Jim Harbaugh, what are you smoking thinking you're getting Saquon Barkley? What you, also, that would just be a bad signing for a team that's in cap. Hell. Yeah. What do you, there's so, we'll get into that later. Yeah. So we'll all yeah. get on to that. But I do think Chargers fans, take a deep breath. Let Jim Harbaugh draft some, let good, him cook. Let him draft some good players. Let them get a staff in place. Let him build a yeah. culture for a year. Maybe you make the playoffs. year or two. Yep. Maybe Give you miss the playoffs and hang out. Because also, you're going to be in the same division with the Chiefs when they win another Super Bowl. So, oh, relax. God. Yeah. Second is the Raiders signing Antonio Pierce. Thank Christ. Well, actually, I'm pissed as a Giants fan because I wanted Antonio Pierce as a DC. But for Raiders fans, thank God you got it. You got him. P- Peter and I had a long conversation about this before the last podcast episode. Yeah. Yep. I think this is such a lateral move. And I really don't think Antonio Pierce is the guy for the Raiders for the next, like, after two, three years. But Peter made the good point that. Like the Raiders aren't going anywhere, so they might yeah. as well build a culture. That's my thing. Is like because while while I could totally understand the argument of you know Antonio Pierce, maybe he's not like the head coach for this team, but for right now, what they're trying to do, they they need to rebuild their roster. Like they need to be able to have a culture that they can then bring players into and say like, look, this is what we're about, and you know then you can bring in kind of like that big name head coach who's like, hey, listen, I'm just here to win. Like, I'm not trying to change anything about your guys' culture. I'm just here to win, and I'm here to coach you guys to the best of my ability. But for right now, they need to build that foundation so that way they can bring in players. They can draft players so that that way they're knowing, like, look, we're coming into the Raider. Like, this is going to be Raider Nation. Like, (laughs) not like the uh, Detroit Lions who are like, oh, we're biting kneecaps over here like Dan Campbell. But, like, you know, the, the, the Raiders, they're a blue collar team. Like they were in Oakland for a really long time. They got like that chip on their shoulder. They're always being counted out, you know, like, and they got a bit of an edge to them. And like, that's yep. really what makes them like unique. That's what makes them, uh, that's what makes their culture like very important mm-hmm. because then when you bring a guy in, it's like, all right, this is what we're looking for in players. So then you can build a team to match that. Yeah. And I think they're looking towards a rebuild. I think it would be foolish for them not to kind of like take a step back this year and get rid of some assets for picks. Oh yeah. So I think, there's no better guy to keep the respect of the players when they're probably going to only win a few games than Antonio. And yeah. yeah, And then eventually you can kind of like fire him as like the fall guy for being bad, but everyone will know that he did a lot for the team Yep, and he'll get a job somewhere else. Yep. Um, so I think the Antonio Pierce hire is cool. Also, they've spent so much money on head coaches between Gruden and McDaniel. Good Lord. That they can't pay another coach. And they talked about this when, Everyone was upset when McDaniels got another year yeah. after the bad first year. Good God. The, everyone doesn't realize the reason he got the extra year was because the the Raiders couldn't afford. They literally couldn't pay anybody else because they paid John Gruden some absurd amount of money to go coach that team. So, oh yeah, um, I'm a really big fan of the Patriots getting Gerard Mayo. Oh yeah, and I think we did talk about it a little bit during the a pod, little bit one I podcast think, yeah. episode. I know some people are like, uh 
promoting a linebackers coach is going to be the same old Patriots culture. Um, same old Patriots culture is really good. Yeah, it is 20 they, years of success. If people forget they yeah. won six Super Bowls. Yeah. Like, I'll take any I'll take good old Patriots culture yeah. any day of the week. Also, when you look at these former players who've gone on to become head coaches, fantastic. Mike Vrabel. Um God, I look like a fool now. I'm not like <laughs> you're in the one. D'Amico Ryan. D'Amico Ryan's, um, yeah. There's a couple other guys too that I can't think of. But uh, Dan Campbell. Yeah. Um, these ex players, like you got an, a Bill Belichick like guy in Gerard Mayo, scheme wise. He was a player for Bill, who's also a former player who can get the respect of those guys. I think they just hired their D'Amico Ryans because yeah. Gerard Mayo is ridiculously underrated and was such an important part of that like Patriots dynasty because he was exactly the type of player that they wanted. No one knew who he was. He just did his job and that was it. And they just won Super Bowls because of him. And he doesn't have this GM ego to him. No. And he's going to hire a good staff around him. Yep. A GM who might finally might start to draft players well. Yep. Now, again, I'm just getting to draft a little bit because these teams who are hiring new coaches are bad. Patriots, please don't draft a quarterback. Please, 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 please <laughs> don't draft a quarterback. I don't think it's a good move for you guys. But. Um, they've got some really good pieces there. Like you think of guys like Christian Gonzalez and yeah, Christian Judon Gonzalez, is there still. Judon. Um, and they can get other guys. And I, I really think it's a good hell. Zeke revived his career there. Yeah, he looked pretty solid. I think it's a really good fit. Again, you're gonna have a year. First year, Gerard Mayo might not be great because that's a good division. Second year, I'd be afraid of the Patriots again because I really think guys might want to go play for that coach and especially defensively wise. Yeah, I think that he's gonna be able to find really good players. Yep. Um, I like to hire a lot and I yep. think it just makes sense. Like don't get a new guy in there. I know like Vrabel, Vrabel I can never say his Vrabel. name. Vrabel. Vrabel. Um, I know people wanted him to come in. It's a lot of pressure for a guy to fill Bill oh, Belichick's yeah. shoes. No one is expecting Gerard Mayo to fill no, 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 Bill no, Belichick's God, no. shoes. And I think that's a good thing. Yep. Titans, Brian Callahan, the OC for the Bengals. It's okay. All right. We'll see if he's like, he's the classic. We'll see if it's a great hire. Or we'll see if it's a bad hire. Like the Titans aren't that good it's right now. Fun, so yeah. it might be it two years until we get the full mm-hmm. scoop on if Brian Callahan's a good coach. So, but he could be. I mean, OC for the Bengals is a decent spot to have. They've had some success. Yep. And good wide receiver play. So I guess you're doing this so that you can get Will Levis and a wide receiver one on the same page and see if that can kind of like revive the offense. But Titans are a team where I really don't know what they're doing. so I don't know what they're doing either. I have no idea. But he's just a classic. You, you needed a head coach. You, you, weren't, gonna offense, get, you yeah. weren't gonna get one of the stars. You drafted Will Levis. You might as well try to give him the support and coaching. And we'll see. Um, Will Levis has just as many tools as Joe Burrow had. Physically, at least. And so, see if Brian Callahan can kind of... Unlock that again. Yeah, unlock that. Panthers uh, getting Dave Canales... Thoughts? Who? Like, this was the same dude that put up nine points against you in the last game of the year. What are we doing? Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think it's a weird place to be. because I think the idea is like Baker Mayfield was coached by this guy and look how good he looked. And maybe he can do the same to Bryce Young. Like, maybe. But the Bucks' uh, talent has been underrated for a while. They still had Chris Godwin. Mike Evans, Baker Mayfield's a good quarterback, and they also sneakily hired an assistant coach. I'm pretty sure, assistant head coach to do like game clock yeah. management and stuff. And I'm just like, do not t- trust your main coach to do that. Yeah, I don't like know. I just thought it was an interesting place. I know you weren't going to get like Bill Belichick or, or Frable, or Frable, or like- Frable, but I just it just feels like a little bit of a reach higher. Like this is a classic thing where, I mean, if it works out, great. It just feels like the classic thing where if like Bryce Young's career goes in the toilet, you're like, well, you gave him Frank Reich who sucked, and you gave him Dave Canales who sucked, and, and now he's a bad quarterback with damaged goods. Him. Yeah, yeah, it's like good lord. So it's a risky play again. I don't really know who was better out there, but um, I just think like Frank Reich was an OC who got the Eagles to the Super Bowl. Dave Canales got the Bucks to a first round, a second round exit in the playoffs. Gee, was he there? Offensive coordinator for a while for the Bucks. Yeah, Dave Canales. Yeah, he well, he's a, he was okay. a, yeah. 
Okay. Well, because I was thinking, because like, oh, okay. he was a, oh, he's a first year OC. Yeah. What are we doing? Like, he wasn't the OC for Brady. No. What? It was his first year. He's super young, apparently. Because uh, what's his face? The head coach for the Bucks is oh Bruce Arians. Arians yeah. Right. No. 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 Because Bruce Arians left. He's in GM now. Who's crap? Why can't I remember his name? Todd Bowles. Todd Bowles. Well, no, Todd Bowles is the head coach. He was the defensive coordinator. Oh, defensive coordinator. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was Bruce Arians was the offense. He ran the offense. But yeah, like, like, I. Oh my god. Whatever. It's fine. Yeah, Who but cares? it's it's fine. But um, Falcons. Raheem Morris. I, I think this is a home run. Not because of Raheem Morris. Because I love the staff he has put together. Yeah, he's put together a really good staff out there. He has had great interviews, like saying. They're like, what do you like about the Falcons? Um, I like B. John Robinson and yeah. Kyle Pitts and Drake London. You're yeah. Like, every no. fantasy ma- manager's like dream. Yeah. Um, they brought over some uh, Rams are a great head coach team. They just won the they won the Super Bowl a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Made a great playoff run this year. I know they lost in the first round exit, but to even get in the playoffs yeah. and everything like that. They brought in the OC, the OC or the quarterback coach for the the Rams to be the offensive yep. coordinator. He's a he's going to be definitely a good guy, a defensive coordinator. He's got had Aaron Donald on his defense, coach that guy up. Yep. Um, I love the hire. I think it's such a good. I think it's a very solid hire. I mean, I'm. It, it's very interesting that they didn't go with an offensive minded head coach with all their weapons on offense. But honestly, at this rate, tried something new because whatever you were doing wasn't working anyway. So yeah. Who cares? I, yeah, I thought offensive coordinator might have been a thing, but when I saw Raheem Morris brought over a lot of the staff on the Rams, I was yeah, like, like that's I a like good. This. Yeah, I like, like that's this. A good pull. Um. Still going forward with that defense, which is a good idea. And I think he'll bring a really good culture and a sense of like mm-hmm. calm over yeah. the franchise a little bit. Because I think that's what they need. Because the Falcons need not pan- hit the panic button. They got they, they got, have talent. They everywhere. have a lot of talent. They just need to figure out how to use it. Yep. And they're going to be a team that's in the market for a quarterback. And I would love to see them move up in the draft for one. Yeah. Seahawks, Mike McDonald. It's just all right. A mid higher, like the defensive coordinator of the. Or a defensive coordinator of the Ravens. Ravens. Cool. I just. I, Why did you get rid of Pete Carroll? I yeah. What was he doing wrong? That's like for me. This doesn't feel like a much much of a separator between Pete Carroll and him. And. That's why I'm kind of just curious, you know, it's just odd. Like, obviously, I think that um, this dude's going to be able to do really well with all the weapons that he has on the defensive roster out there. But it's just like, why? It just doesn't really like this dude. It doesn't like scream. Like, if you were to like, you know, uh, Steve Spagnuolo was a head coach at one point, but like, it's like if you were to give like, oh my god, like this is a like legendary defensive coordinator. Like, this dude's kind of a young defensive coordinator. Not saying he won't do a good job, but it's just like. Pete Carroll's been there for so long. And yeah. Like he is like part of the identity of the Seahawks. Like he's part of that culture. He's part of like what made that team so good. And then you're just like, oh yeah, we're gonna shoo you out the door, and then we're gonna bring in some random guy. Yeah, and I don't want to be that guy that just keeps going. Oh well, you should have hired an OC because you need a you're gonna need a quarterback, and you need that guy to be on the same page with the quarterback. But the Seahawks feel like a team that have the defensive personnel, don't really have the offensive personnel. And then you brought in a defensive coordinator to like spur that move into the future when the Seahawks really feel like to me they're a team on the outside looking in for mm-hmm. NFC relevancy. Like you think of teams like the Cowboys, the Eagles, Packers, Cowboys, Lions, Eagles, 49ers, Lions, 49ers, yeah. um, the Rams, even the Falcons to a certain extent. Like those all feel teams like teams that are better than the Seahawks. And the, the Falcons Seahawks, are better than the Seahawks is a wild take. Oh, I think so. I think the Falcons are winning that division. All right. I I really like. Right. We'll get into that. We'll later. get into over unders yes. or wins predictions at some point. I whatever, whatever the Falcons line is at now. Let me just yeah. tell you, they're winning more games than the Chargers. Oh my god. Um, and then the last team we talked about a little bit, Dan Quinn, Cliff Kingsbury. Just like why? I like I Dan know. Quinn, who coached the Cowboys, who are in the same division as the Commanders, is now the head coach for the Commanders. Like I'm just in a division that do- it doesn't really feel winnable for the Commanders right now. Like why? Yeah, there's just better options. Like I'm not saying you could have gotten Bill Belichick or that you could have gotten v- Mike, but Big Mike. But you could have interviewed them, promoted the enemy. You could have, pre- yeah. Like you have a guy in there that made your not that great quarterback look. You could have halfway just, decent. You could have put the the enemy can't head coach. 
debate to rest and just vibe for a year and gotten a better pick. But instead, you're going to like get a DC that we're not sure is actually a good DC. And then hopefully, hopefully Caleb Williams can force his way to the commanders. And you think that's going to revive your team? I it just it just doesn't make sense. Man. I just think it's a, a really mediocre it's a, hire. It's a mediocre and desperate hire. And if they do eventually make the playoffs with Dan Quinn as a defensive coordinator, we're all going to say, "Well, is he just going to have a fumble again in the play in the playoffs?" And they're going to fire him, and we're going to be like, "Well, here the Commanders firing another head coach." No, they are. Felt like they could have almost like tried to get make a smart hire with a young guy on a staff somewhere. Yep. And just been like, you know, this guy, like I see something in him. He's got a fire in him. And, and, and gone for it i know ben johnson was in consideration for the job and something mm-hmm. weird happened there and whatever i was thinking of like off like offensive coordinator for the packers for example mm. they had a really good year drafted some really good players there i know Mc, mcfleur uh floor mcfleur yeah holds the uh calls the offense but could you give in their oc an interview um just a more interesting like decisions you could have made at commanders as a young team but oh well that's the coaching roundup good lord what do you think is the best hire out of the list best hire i would say is probably gerard mayo um then probably jim harbaugh yeah i'd say jim harbaugh is still the best hire because you had to um and i think it's i think it's really good just to change the narrative of the chargers as an organization um but i sneaky love the rookie morris and i think it'll work out really well for that team so peter that's the NFL season right there. Oh my god! I can't when we when we come it. back, we'll officially have Super Bowl Fifty Eight champion crowned. It will be the Chiefs. Oh god! I can't wait for that to be clipped. <laughs> and then we'll be starting to break down the NBA. Get back into the NBA for a little bit, and then god we'll talk forbid about the MLB. Ugh. Yeah, MLB, and then we'll break down divisions and the draft will come up soon. Oh yeah, a lot of content still to come. The football season has been real. We'll it's been it. a wild one. It, it has been. Every football season is. Yeah. Every time I get to the end of the NFL season, I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted. Like, yeah. but then of course it's going to be like June, and we're like, damn. And I'm twitching because I'm like, I need, I need football. I need, need football. It. Yeah, I'm definitely not shaking because you want to start gambling. Definitely not. No, definitely not. Not Surely that. Not, not that. Not Surely that. not. Surely not. Um, if you've listened this far. Thank you very much. Um, great for watch time, of course. Um, please like, comment, subscribe, share. It helps our channel out a lot as we try to grow. And other than that, we will see you next time on the Coconut Curry Podcast.